Hi, it's Rob Moore here and we're on Lockdown Interview Live. What else is there to do on lockdown? Um, so I'm here with uh, Matt Haycock, so you should be able to see there on the screen. And uh, he's kindly interviewing me for his podcast, the Matt Haycock's podcast. Um, so I am his humble servant. We're streaming to his community as well. So we're doing like a simultaneous double live stream. Let me get a better angle where there's less light in the background. So yeah, um, Matt, I'm all yours. Let's do it. Okie dokie. Guys, it's Matt Haycox here. And today I've got a guest with me who for many of you will need no introduction at all. He's the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Rob Moore. For those of you who do need a bit of an intro, he is the co-founder of the Progressive Property and Progressive Success Empire. He's also the host of a number one podcast, which is Disruptive Entrepreneur, which I do listen to. He's one of the very few I subscribe to. So looking forward to asking him some questions myself. Um, and I know a lot of you guys are looking forward to getting involved with this as well. As always, during the Corona lockdown podcast, we're streaming it live to my audience at the same time. So uh, you'll have to, have to forgive a bit of interaction and questions if you guys are watching or listening to this after the fact. Rob, thanks for being here, buddy. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's, it's kind of um, kind of fun to do these on Zoom. I'm like you. We were talking before and I prefer doing podcast interviews and discussions face to face because I think you have that connection element, that human element. You don't have that little lag sometimes when the connection isn't quite perfect, which can just break a bit of rapport. But of course, now that we have no choice, and um, we could do plenty more of these and everyone's on Zoom now or Be Live or StreamYard or Facebook Live. Um, so, yeah. And by the way, this isn't a dressing gown. You said this was a dressing gown. This is an expensive <laughs> jumper. I, 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 I wouldn't have said that to show you up now. Or on camera. <laughs> I, I, I've had a shower and got, spe- got specially ready for Rob. And he comes on the, ca- comes on the stream. And I thought he was wearing his cozy young dressing gown. I thought I'm going to put my pajamas on again um but no it's it's, it's it's interesting what you're saying and, and i guess i'm i'm trying to take as many positives out of this situation and, and that's what, obviously what i'm talking to my audience about and i'm sure i'm sure you are too and and i think some of the some of the changes that have happened during this will actually stay in place afterwards for me and one of the big ones with one of the big ones with the podcast i think is on the bigger interviews, you know, either the celebrity guests, the better known guests, or the ones where there's much longer conversations to be had, I'm always going to want to try and do those, do those in um, in the flesh as much as possible. Like you say, you've got that that rapport, that rapport, and it's, it's just there's just something better about it. But I think this has also given me the time uh, to get some guests on who maybe in the nicest possible way you can't talk to them for an hour, uh, but you know, but they've got five or ten minutes of interesting conversation here and there, which you know, which we can strip down into. Small smaller podcasts or smaller sound bites or whatever. So I think I think as a strategy going forward, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely keep the, these remote podcasts in my in my armory. Now listen, t- tell 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 the guys tell the guys who don't know you um, a, a bit about your background, how it started. Because when, when I was genning up on this, I think you started as an artist, didn't you? So tell us how do you go from artist to property developer, investor, trainer, and all around superstar. Yeah, so how do I tell my same story in a different way to my audience who've heard it a hundred times? Um, so my dad was an entrepreneur, is an entrepreneur, and always taught me the value of work, going to get work, getting a job, going and hustling for work from the age of six. Um, and I used to go around washing people's cars, and I used to go do my the <coughs> excuse me <coughs> the bottling up at my dad's pub, and the cleaning and the tidying and the emptying the fruit machines and the pool tables and counting all the money. Uh, And that was how I was raised. And then I went to school and got into the school system and GCSE and A-level and and felt like I was restricted in the school system. It wasn't really for entrepreneurs, was it? Um, You know, doctor, dentist, lawyer, accountant, that's fine through school. Um, But entrepreneur, someone who works for themselves, it's not really the way the school system um, procures you, develops you. And so I felt that got stifled and then I lost my way. I went to, to GCSEs, A-levels and uni and just really got interested in kind of girls and hanging out with my mates and not, you know, I only did school work because I didn't want to fail. I didn't do school work because I enjoyed school work. Um, I went to university only because I didn't want to be deemed as a failure. I just didn't enjoy university at all from the, the, the subject perspective. Um, and then came back and was supposed to just work in my mum and dad's pub for a couple of months because dad was getting, dad was a bit ill and mum said, come and work for, a, you know, 
the, the, the summer holidays until you decide what you want to do career wise. And I said, fine. And then three years later, I was still there. And I'd built up some debt from university and then three years working in my mum and dad's pub and earning 200 quid a week, but spending 250 quid a week and getting a car loan for a car and going out every weekend and drinking and socialising. And I just kind of lost the sense of who I am um, and what I wanted to do with my life. Now, one thing I feel strongly is that at school, no one ever sat me down, none of my teachers to say, Rob, what do you, who are you and what do you want to do with your life? Who are you and what do you want to do with your life? Who are you and what do you want to do with your life? And I think you should be asking that yourself regularly. And I didn't ask myself that from the age of probably 12 to 25 years old. No wonder I was lost. Um, and then, um, long story very short, is my dad had a big nervous breakdown in his pub. He got sectioned in front of everyone, including me and my family. Um, and he, um, it was our first experience of his bipolar. And it was hard. And I felt a lot of shame because my dad had worked hard through school, me, you know, putting me through all private schools and paying for my university and my accommodation and giving me everything I'd needed. But that young entrepreneur he'd sort of raised, I'd, I'd lost that sense of self. Um, and I'd got comfortable and bored and complacent and, and somewhat dismissive and arrogant, I suppose. Um, and I didn't really have any direction. Um, and then when that happened with my dad, it woke me the fuck up really quickly. It was like a big, big, big wake up call because um, it was the hardest thing that's ever happened to me. But it was also it, it was so hard, but he didn't die. So it was like I still had another chance. It was like a, a, a warning or a light bolt of warning, but I had, I had a chance. So then I started reading books on personal development and ed education and money. I started going to property networking events and um, started looking into all the business opportunities that are out there. A few people in my life had guided me along that way, mentors, if you like, who at the time I didn't know were mentors, but a guy who was hanging my work in a gallery and a, a, a one of the few galleries I was actually selling work regularly in. And he was, what, in his late 50s? And I was in my mid-20s. And he's like, Rob, you should get into property. Rob, you should read all these books. You should read Think and Grow Rich. You should read Richest Man in Babylon. You should read uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I was like, I don't want to fucking read those shitty books. Um, uh, and then, of course, you know, the day, the week, the month after what had happened to my dad, I was like, give me those books. Where are those networking events? I'll go. Because I was all of a sudden humbleized to the point where I was a humble student instead of a complacent, cocky, someone know it all, even though he knew nothing. Um, and that was the start of my journey. And this was in 2005, December 2005. Um, I met my business partner at my very first networking event, Mark Homer. We now own, co-own, manage over 800 properties together. We have various companies. The, the worth of those is in the tens of millions. Um, and life's very different. And of course... You know, my podcast done really well. My books have done really well. My personal brand does well. Um, all because I tuned into and found my journey. You know, who I am and what I'm meant to be. When people ask me, who am I? I'm an entrepreneur and I know that in my bones. And even though all those people are going online and say, oh, well, what, what really is an entrepreneur? And how do you, can you define an entrepreneur? And they have to have done this and that. Nothing anyone can say can make me feel any different about myself. I know I'm an entrepreneur. I know it's what I'm meant to do for the rest of my life. And I love it. And I'm kind of addicted to it. And so writing books and doing podcasts and doing lives and doing all these interviews. I often do one of, one of these a day now. Um, it just comes second nature now. Um, so that's the short version, Matt. Oh, <laughs> you know, I was just smiling to myself when, when you were talking about the books that uh, that, that, that guy was telling you to read, because it's, it's funny how the, you know, the same books come up, I mean, literally with, with every single person you speak to. It's because, I mean, obviously I've, I've read all of those books and, and um, you know, I, I'm a, a big fan of recommending them to anyone. But whenever I do someone else's podcast and, and they ask me what, you know, what books I like or what books I recommend, I always I always feel it's so cliched that, you know, it's so cliched in this space now to, to, to say those. So, you know, as, as much as I do still recommend them, there's some of the kind of things that I still for, force on my daughter to, you know, to earn a pocket money. Um, I, I, I always I always now uh, re recommend recommend and different ones but i mean that they, they are you know just the absolute cl classics of uh, of life business personal development and and and, and common sense i think Listen, yeah, let's, just quickly on let's that Matt, if i just jump yeah. in on that 
because I know what you mean, yeah. but I don't really care if a cliche is a cliche. If something, oh, yeah, 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 if it's rare or if it's common, if it works, it works. Um, and for people who have read the common books, Think and Grow Rich, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, um, a lot of people now cite my book, Start Now, Get pe- Perfect Later on my book, Money. Um, for those people, if you want something different, read autobiographies. Because if you read up on virtually any successful person and in totally different areas of life. So I like reading up on musicians, you know, film stars, celebrities, sports personalities, um, singers, um, people who are in bands, uh, because then you get the common traits of success, which I think we need to learn, but the individual traits in individual people and individual niches. So once you've gone beyond the maybe 30 or 50 um, like staple diet personal development books, which are vital, like you said, Matt, and maybe some of them are cliche. I'd love one of my books to be a cliche because that means it's sold 10 million copies. Um, then, then go on to autobiographies. I've got so much out of book autobiographies, but also the film ones, you know, on Netflix, all the business and successful, like the um, Taylor Swift one was really good. I watched recently. The McQueen one's the best one ever. The Steve Jobs one is obviously really good. The Arnold Schwarzenegger ones are great. There's so many good ones. Um, yeah, so sorry, Matt, you were just going to ask me something. No, but, but it's, it's interesting what you say as well, because it just makes, makes me think of another point, which is, I guess, you know, when, when I do these podcasts, you know, I, I do them with a whole manner of different people, you know, who, who are all successful in some kind of field, you know, m- m- maybe not traditionally successful or, 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 you know, or stereotypically successful, but, you know, but, but they've, all, they've all got some kind of story to tell and some kind of a, a, advice to give. And, you know, I was asked recently what, to, you know, what my kind of one um, goal with all my podcasts I do is. And, uh, and obviously, aside from aside from growing my own audience, you know what what I really want to be able to do is to say that at the end of every every podcast, you know whether it's ten minutes long or sixty minutes long, that there is a single piece of you know immediately actionable and tangible advice, you know that that, that you can that you can take away from that person, you know wh- wh- whether they're old. I've got two 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 pieces of advice. Yeah, I'll give you I'll give you them right now. I'm sure you've got more, plenty yeah. more. Yeah. So one would be start now, get perfect later. I wrote a book called Start Now, Get Perfect Later. And I speak to thousands of startup entrepreneurs who are scared to start, scared to do a live, scared to quit their job, scared to to start their second side hustle, you know, scared to take whatever plunge or action. Um, And no one is perfect when they start. Every master was once a disaster. Every winner was once a beginner. So immediately, if you take the... One bit of advice, Matt, which is to start now and get perfect later. I think your life will become meaningful. Uh, I think you will have growth, progress, satisfaction, value. Um, I mean, every every black belt was once a white belt. You know, every um, amazing musician was once a grade one or not even a grade one. And then the second piece would be if you don't risk anything, you risk everything. So I suppose if there's two quotes I'm the most known for, it would be start now, get perfect later. And if you don't risk anything, you risk everything, which I say at the end of every single one of my podcasts and videos. I must have said that quote 50,000 times. If you don't risk anything, you risk everything. Um, So you you can take small risks, calculated risks, um, comfortably uncomfortable risks. But, you know, life is about constant and progressive risks. You know, we don't know the results before we go into anything at all. There is no guarantees of anything in life. But if you don't risk anything, you risk everything. (laughs) So let's, let's 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 talk about property and Corona specifically. I mean, how how was how has your business been been affected during the crisis, uh, and and what and what advice are you giving to your mentees? I mean, how can people still get involved in the property market right now, or or, or, or can't they? Is now the time for education to you know to, to, to be ready when they come out? I mean, I mean, I'm you know I'm not big in property, but you know, but, but but I do I do have a property investment business myself, and you know as as much as you know we're we're still hungry for business, and and you know we are coming across some good deals because there's people who are hungry to sell you know the physical transaction process is getting difficult i mean i mean i, I had a sale of, i mean a, a property we bought recently that we were trying to sell um the sale fell through yesterday because the buyer's buyer uh, fell down in a chain because it, you know he, he he didn't want to um he didn't want to move during corona so that you know the, there's as much as there's opportunities there's all kinds of you know uh, problems as well i mean what, what what's what's your take as the as the property master how, how can we how can we survive during this time okay so there's two areas or three areas even i'd look at one would be our construction development sites 
One would be our general portfolio and one would be our training business. Um, and they're all different. So I'll go with the property angle first and not our training business. Um, so obviously you've got to try and um, negotiate with your landlords and or your tenants to keep as much money coming in and as little money going out as possible. And the whole world is on that hustle right now, that survival. So speaking to your landlords and your tenants and negotiating either them not having a payment holiday on you and or you having a payment holiday on them, depending on where you're at and what your affordability is. The next thing I think is accelerated immersion. So the reality is you can't do viewings now, but some of auction houses are allowing you to, um, they're, they're, they're doing video viewings and they're still doing auctions. So you can sit in and watch, watch auctions. Don't buy, um, you know, but watch and learn. All that, those online courses you've wanted to do for a long time, those podcasts you've wanted to listen to, those audio books you've wanted to listen to, you know, that course you've wanted to go back to that you did before, those communities you've wanted to engage in more, you can do that now in an accelerated fashion. Um, so my training business, Progressive Property, it's the UK's largest property training company. We've uh, created a lot of online courses now. We've launched our rent to rent online course. We've launched our desktop deal packaging course. And we're giving people education that they can do in the lockdown. But where we might have done a course um, for two or three days in two or three months time, or we might have done an online course where we're doing two hours a week modules. We're doing three to four hours every other day so that people can accelerate their learning and immerse themselves. Um, you know, no one knows how long we've got left. But if we've got 60 days, if we've got 90 days, you want to be ready with all the education, the motivation, the enthusiasm, the past passion, the hunger, all the viewings booked up, you know, the relationships with the agents. And this can be done online, all the research on Rightmove, so that literally the day the doors open, you can go and view 10 houses a day for the next five days. And what a lot of people are going to do is just sort of wait and wait until everything starts again and then try and get educated or book viewings or whatever. And there's going to be a three to six month lag for them. The next thing is we've got a big development project going on right now. It's about 100 units. We do have another one, but it's in early stages. So that's not so much affected. But, um, you know, thankfully, the government allowed construction projects to continue. Um, now, obviously, we're slightly skeleton staff on that. But we've, you know, we've got a, a big crane up, which costs us, what, over a thousand pounds a day. So we want to be able to continue to develop and build. Um, and that, that project is going ahead and we're developing and building that. Um, and probably not quite as many staff on site as normal um, and, and not as many builders, merchants open, but at least that's progressing. So it's slowed down, but it is carrying on. Uh, and, uh, and it was very important that we do carry that on um, because, you know, that, would, that, that costs us hundreds of thousands of pounds a month uh, to develop that project. Um, it's about 20 million pound and in Peterborough, 20 million pound is like 200 million pound in central London. Um, so it's important that we kept that going. Um, I'm even further north. Can you imagine what 20 million is up here? <laughs> yeah, about £4.50 probably. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then working out all the new government legislation. So the grants, the loans, the exemptions or the delays of VAT and tax and what's applicable to business owners who own limited companies and self-employed and really figuring that out because, the, you know, they're making a new announcements all the time and then they, they give you the furloughing and they give you the deferred VAT and they give you the deferred um, income tax, but then you've got to figure out and apply and work out when they pay it. And that's a constant evolution because it's all new. So you've got to keep yourself abreast of that. Um, so I'd say they're the main things. Cool. Listen, we, you, you mentioned him earlier and I, I wanted to talk about your, your partner, not your, your partner sp specifically, but I mean, obviously, uh, you know, in, in, in your story and, and, and in your business, you know, you, you, you've got a partner who, who you talk about how he's been, uh, I guess you've each been pivotal to each other's success. Um, I mean, you, you hear some fantastic partnership stories, you hear probably even more horror partnership stories. You know, what, what, what is your advice to people out there looking to get a partner? Uh, I mean, I mean you know, should, should ev does everybody need to have a partner? You know, does it just work for some people in some situations? And if you are going to go and get one, what are the traits you need to look for and how do you manage that relationship? Yeah, so I love it when people talk about partners, like how are you going to go and get one? Like you can go down the local shop and just buy one off the shelf. <laughs> um, so, so do you need a partner? No. Do you need people? Yes. So, you know, can you build a property portfolio or a business empire on your own? No. 
There is no I in team. Uh, if you study people like Arnold Schwarzenegger, he'll say there, there is no such thing as self-made. Uh, and if you look at every successful person, they've got a good PA, a good ops manager, a good MD, a CEO, a chairman, a board, a team, staff. You need people. So, you know, it just so happens that my successful partnership is with a business partner. But your successful partnership could be with a letting agent or a refurbs manager or a project manager. So you don't specifically need a business partner who you have 50-50 shares in everything. Because Mark and I have 50-50 shares in everything. Um, but you do need people and good people. And that is great leverage, having good people. You know, a construction or project manager knows way more about project managing construction site than me. So I leverage their experience. And because they get em employed by me, so they leverage my, my money and my experience. As I, can't, um, I can't do the conveyancing for a house. I can't do the legals for a joint venture. But a conveyancer or a, a commercial solicitor can do that. Now, uh, the great benefit of having a partner over just an individual who's in your team is... Um, I guess, increased leverage, increased support, increased loyalty, accountability, um, feeling like you're not alone, feeling like you're in the trenches with someone. You celebrate the successes together. You support the, the defeats together. Uh, and that, for me, are the greatest reasons to have a business partner. Um, and, and, and I still think it depends on your personality as well. Um, if you're a bit of an introvert, um, there would be an argument that maybe one isn't right for you, but there'd be an, a counter argument that maybe you should have one. Because you're an introvert. Yeah. Um, so the, the key to having the right people is that they are the opposite of you. That's the main key. I think similar vision, different skills. So with Mark, Mark wants to be in business for the rest of his life. So do I. Mark loves property. So do I. Mark loves business. So do I. Mark loves, you know, the, the, the chase and the thrill of the deal or making a bit of money or doing well. So do I. With similar age. So the main values and the vision is similar. But then everything else is different. Um, so he's numbers, analytical, bit of a worrier, bit of a doomsday thinker, very careful, focuses on, on being lean. Whereas I'm much bigger picture, uh, probably uh, more energy and drive and push, um, more chaotic for sure, more creative, definitely, sometimes dis more destructive. Um, he's more ordered, I'm more chaotic. I'm more creative, he's more... Um, technical, I'm more strategic, he's more operational. And there's, there's, so therefore, there's a, that, that symbiotic fit. And what a lot of people do is they try to go in business with themselves and they don't realise it. They try and hire themselves and they don't realise it. Because unconsciously, our ego wants people to agree with us and to be like us. And we only normally agree with people who are like us. But you don't want to go into business with yourself. That would be, you know, if, if two people in a business partnership are doing the same thing, then one person isn't needed. Now, to find one, you just have to look. But the key is to look without them knowing you're watching. So what Mark, my business partner, is really good at is he's really good at going, oh, I need this person. And I will watch them online for three to six months. And I will go to networking events and I will talk to them. And they have no idea that he's testing them or watching them or that, you know, he might potentially work with them in the future. Because Mark believes that as soon as you tell people that, you know, you want to work with them or there could be a partnership, they start selling to you or they start showing you their best self instead of their real self. Um, so, and a lot of people jump into partnerships too early. So Mark and I didn't jump into partnerships too early. And he watched me at a distance for two to three months before he decided to do any, anything in the form of a partnership with me. Now for Mark, two to three months is quick. And I think the reason it happened quick is because I met a lot of his, um, I was so different to him that I ticked a lot of boxes that he couldn't tick. And, and I'm pretty good at starting things and making things happen fast. That's part of who I am. Um, and then when we partnered, we did it low risk. So a lot of people think you've got to get a heads of terms and a consultancy agreement or a partnership agreement. You've got to get a commercial solicitor involved. And look, for big deals, yes. But when you start a partnership, and maybe, maybe why don't you start buying one house together? And, you know, one, the person, Mark put the money in, so he had the first charge. And then I got uplift on the equity. Um, and so his risk was covered. I got, um, up, I got upside, but he had all the risk covered. You know, I didn't, uh, I wasn't, um, he wasn't, um, he wasn't assuming any risk. Um, so the first property worked, so we bought a second. The second property worked, so we bought a third. The third property worked, so we bought a fourth. Um, Fantastic. Listen, let's, let's talk branding. 
Uh, I mean, obviously, you are everywhere now. Uh, you know, uh, you, you're on you're on the internet, you're on social media. You've got you've got your own podcast. You know, you're an author and a speaker, and you, you, you're you're clearly someone who has um, who was fu- fully fully embraced you know, the the concept of the personal brand, and and I guess all all, all the great things it will do for your business. Um, I, mean, I mean, when when did you decide to go all in on it? You know, what what inspired you, or who inspired you? When when did you realize? That, you know that, that this would make make the difference to be able to leverage your business. I probably went in on building my personal brand all in probably about five years ago, Matt. It, I couldn't tell you exactly. It wasn't like there was a eureka moment when I woke up in the middle of the night sweating with a light bulb above my head. I, 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 eureka! I need to build a personal brand. Um, I can tell you what started. I mean, I mean, I mean, just sorry to interrupt, but but were there were there other people, you know, let's say with a big personal brand at this point that that, that you saw doing well? You know, it, it, was that what gave gave you the impetus to do it? Um, yes and no. So I think um, I've read a lot of business books. I've um, had and continue to have many mentors and I'm in business masterminds and I like to do lots of education on business. You know, I'll do plenty of courses on it. Um, And so one of the things that comes up a lot when you do that is the need to systemize your business, to de-risk it, to scale it, that it shouldn't be reliant on you. And, um, you know, that's the apex of of me being reliant and my business being reliant on me simultaneously was about five years ago. Um, we, uh, we, yes, we had built quite a few hundred properties in our portfolio and Mark was mostly managing that with a team. So I was mostly not involved in that, but I was the main speaker trainer for progressive property, our training company. And in one year I did about 250 speaking days. Now I know good, good friends of mine like Gerald Ratner, who does probably that amount, if not more speaking gigs a year, but he'll do a 60 minute speech or a 45 minute speech. Um, whereas I would do a whole day. So 250 whole days out of 365. And I kind of burned out a bit. I, st- I had a couple of out-of-body experiences. It was the year I got the world record for the longest public speech. So I battered myself a bit. And, you know, for a few... How long was that? I, 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 did, I did read that in your bio. How long? Yeah, 47 and a half hours it was um, straight. So, um, yeah, basically... I got to the point where I was like, I've read all these books. I know that you to systemize and to scale, the business needs to be not reliant on you. If it's reliant on you, you don't have a scalable or a saleable business. And I'd read the books and I knew, I knew it in theory, um, but I was still working really hard and a big, a big part of the business needed me. So um, I made a decision to separate my own brand from the company brand. So we made a strategic play. We made an announcement to our community and followers and clients that Mark was um, going to build his own brand here. I was going to build my own brand there. And Progressive is a separate brand. It is not Robin Mark at Progressive Property. It's Progressive Property. And then I was training trainers and speakers and course providers and educators and, you know, um, um, commentators and influencers. I've trained more than 100 of them now. Um, and they took over the front line um, in um, the progressive training business. So I stepped back and retired from speaking. Um, and we've, we've got, what, 95 staff across th- our three main companies. Um, and we've got an MD that manages those. So I'm, I'm not, I don't need to be the MD of the company. You could say I'm more strategic than that. Um, and at that time, I was probably heavily studying a lot of the American influencers. So, you know, the usual names that pop up, um, it might be Gary Vaynerchuk, Grant Cardone, Tim Ferriss, Joe Rogan, um, a lot of the, the, you know, the big superstars like um, Arnold Schwarzenegger that I've admired for a long time, study billionaires. Um, You know, I I like Robin Sharma, Ed Milet. I could list... 250 American influencers that I follow. Um, And because America are usually a few years ahead in that regard. And I'd read every book that you could get, Matt. I was reading at one point 100, 150 books a year um, on Audible, on audio, because I found that easier. Um, And so all this was coming together at the same point. And I've always had something to say. And, you know, my experience in public speaking, doing over 1,000, 1,200 probably speeches, meant I felt comfortable doing live videos and putting my content out there. So all these worlds collided 
um, about five years ago. And then I just made the strategic plan. Right, I'm going to start teaching entrepreneurship and business, not just property. I'm going to take my brand on up to a much wider niche and I'm going to leave progressive and property to um, all my trainers and I'm going to develop those. Um, and fast forward five years and what have I written now? 15 books. Just finished number 16. It's called Opportunity. I've got two podcasts, which have got millions of followers and downloads. I think I have about nearly 2 million followers across all the platforms. I think I have um, more than two and a half million views a month on social media and YouTube. And I'm not a celebrity. I've not, um, you know, got millions of followers by being a famous name. I just put regular content out there, put a lot of content out there. Um, so I did it because I wanted to de-risk progressive property being reliant on me. I did it because I wanted progressive property to be worth more money and I realised it'd be worth more money without me. I did it because I was following so many Americans and a few Brits um, who, you know, had clearly proven to me that it's really scalable and viable. I did it because I enjoy it. I did it because it's, I have a separate asset now. Everyone who loves property believes in assets. You know, you buy a property, you hope to get it set, you hope to have it rented out and you hope to have not too much ongoing management. So you hope to have relatively passive or residual income. And you know that a property investment is an asset. Well, I believe a book is an asset, a video is an asset, a podcast is an asset, and a personal brand is an asset. So I just took, took my same investment and asset pro thought process from property into building a personal brand. So the reason I'll happily do a podcast vid uh, interview a day is because, Matt, you know, this podcast might be up on your show for five years. Um, and so in five years... 10,000 or 50,000 or 500,000 people might get exposed to my work. Now, if this was a live that wasn't recorded, that didn't go on your podcast, and then once we finished the live, it got deleted, I probably wouldn't do it because I wouldn't see it as an investment of time. I'd see it that I'd spent my time. Um, so, yeah, so personal... Sure. Mm. I, I, I like that you. I like that you used the word asset for for, for personal brand because so, so just stretching out that concept. You know, for for, for a lot of the, the the old school people who still can't get their head around personal branding and see it nothing more nothing more than ego driven or or you know the, you know the desire for for celebrity for celebrity's sake. Let's 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 go with the asset word. T t tell tell me about what what you would describe as some of the dividends that that that, that have been that have been paid off that asset. Yeah. So in anyone who wanting to build a personal brand, I would use my same philosophy of start now, get perfect later. And if you don't risk anything, you risk everything. Start doing one minute videos, start doing five minute podcasts on a tiny little Zoom H1 like this that costs 80 quid. You know, like this is the new radio. This and this is the new TV. That, that is the reality. So media has been decentralized and fragmented. And now um, non initially non-famous people get more listens on their podcast than BBC does on their radio. And initially non-famous YouTubers get more views on their YouTube videos than BBC TV. And so that's, that's exciting. And if you can't see that, you need a, a wet fish slap in the face. Um, now, for those who say, oh, well, it's just about being a celebrity and being ego driven. I believe everybody has an ego, therefore everyone is ego driven, um, even the people that make out that they're not. Um, we, we, we equally serve ourselves and serve others. So we, we all have our own motives. I don't really care what anyone thinks about me if they think I'm doing this for ego. You know, some people accuse me. Um, I did a um, basically long story, really short, Matt, and I will get to your final answer, but it's important to answer all the questions. Sure. Um, Long story really short is my sister struggled for, for a, a good deal of her life with being independent because um, she's always worked for my mum and dad and, um, and she's tried to do her own thing and she's done really well at times. And then she sort of come back to the comfort of, um, you know, working in and with and for the family. And I get that because I had that. It's not a judgment on my sister. It's just where she's at. Um, and I've sort of over the years tried to help her get her independence um, and she's become ill over the last couple of years. She's got a really chronic kidney condition uh, to the point where it was quite life-threatening and she needed desperately an operation. 
Sure. Now, I could have given her the money. I could, of course, easily afford £15,000. Um, but she didn't ask me for the money. And I knew that um, she didn't want me to give her the money. Well, part of her probably did. But she wanted to do this for herself. I know that for a fact. She said that. So she set up a Just Giving page. She said, look, I I've, I've been knocked back six months and six months and six months by the NHS. I feel like I'm at my wits end. I need to have a private operation. Will you help me? And she set up a GoFundMe page. And she shared it on her Facebook group. And I think she raised 700, 800 quid. And it was really good. And then it got up, I think, just to over a grand. And then she WhatsApp me and she said, look, Rob, I've done this. Um, she didn't ask me for the money. And I just thought, you know what? I'm going to go out there. I'm going to support her. So I did a couple of posts on my social media. Um, in less than 24 hours, we hit the 15 grand. We actually got to 17 grand. And it was one of the, the sweetest feelings that I've ever felt in my life. Um, and then I got quite a lot of hate for that. Um, there was a fraternity of people who hate on pretty much everyone. So it wasn't personal, but accusing me of being disgusting. I should have paid for that myself. Um, and I'm just doing this to get uh, adulation from my, you know, um, blinded fan base. I should have just paid for the, uh, the operation myself. Um, and that proved to me that it doesn't matter what you do and the good that you do in the world and how you do it, there's always going to be someone that criticises you. And if you think about it, it's pretty hard to criticise raising 20, uh, 17 grand in less than 24 hours for someone who needs a life-threatening operation. That's pretty hard to say there's something wrong with that. But my, my critics still managed to find a way to say that I was disgusting because I didn't pay for it myself, even though they, they didn't even ask why. They didn't even do the research to find out the history of why I didn't pay for it myself. Um, because my sister wanted to keep her dignity, which she did. And her, dig and her dignity is important to her. Um, so, you know, you said, oh, some people think personal branding is just about being a celebrity or ego. Who fucking cares what anyone else thinks? People are going to think what they're going to think no matter what you do and no matter how much good you do in the world. So I say, fuck it, be yourself. Now, when it comes, it's called personal branding. So if there's ever an, an area of business and life where you have permission to be yourself, it's personal branding. Because it's personal, i.e. it's you. Now, I've got supporters. I've got nearly 3,000 supporters who are on the Facebook supporter program. And I had, a, I had a pretty intense therapy session this morning and I felt pretty wounded after it. And I immediately did a 10-minute voice memo to my supporters and just shared it with them. And I've had a, an influx of um, positive, grateful messages. Um, and I am just being myself and expressing myself. And that's what being a personal brand is, being yourself and expressing yourself. Now... Let's go to the time element. I haven't got time. It's overwhelming. There's YouTube, there's podcast, there's Facebook, there's Instagram, there's blah, blah, blah. So that's where the asset building comes in. So right now, I actually should have recorded this. That's why I've got this. I forgot to clip it on. But usually when I'm doing... Thank you. So this could go on my podcast. This is live streaming to Matt's community. This can go on Matt's podcast. It will go on Matt's podcast. And it's going to my Facebook community. And it can be repurposed for YouTube. So that's five pieces of content in one. So that, that's the asset building element of that. Uh, and and yeah, I think for, for, for me, you know, the, the one word I always say when, when I get asked a question is, you know, it, it, it's opportunity. You know, if, if you have an audience, you have opportunity. And by definition, the bigger, of your, the bigger your audience, the bigger your opportunity. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's do you want to go out looking for things and having to knock hard on doors? Or do you want to you know, do you want them to fall at your doorstep? And you know, in the in the very very microscopic personal brand I've got in, you know, in the, in the grand scheme of the world, you know, the things that come to my door, you know, whether, whether that's an easier opportunity to get an investor or, you know, the, the, the chance to meet someone that is going to you know, make a material difference to my life. You know, mm. these things would not have happened without personal brand. And I think, you know, I'll always say the reality is we all have a personal brand anyway. Yeah. You know, it's just the two, the two people know about it or the two million people know about it. Yeah. So I um, mean, yeah, I'm with you. I can't, I cannot, cannot overstress the importance. Well, listen, it's been fantastic having you here. I'm obviously I'm c c c conscious of time. But I've, I've got one personal question I want to ask you now. Nine which, inches. Which is, uh, Surely for my, purely for my benefit, although I'm sure some other people will, uh, will get some use out of this. It's just from what you were saying earlier, um, where you said you were reading, uh, you know, one, 100 to 150 books a year, but, you know, but do, doing it on audio. I'm a big fan 
of the audio book concept because obviously you know th- theoretically it's easier to do or we, we can do it in the background but i've got two problems one when i do it i either fall asleep <laughs> and i have to keep going back and back and back or i'm doing it whilst multitasking and therefore not 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 properly uh, absorbing um uh, you know not properly absorbing what's going on yeah um so so what, what i mean what is your tip for me to make better use of the audio book concept um, to to not let your conscious mind get in the way and instead of seeing that as a problem, see that as a good thing. So, you know, if you went to a therapist, a, a, a hypnotist therapist, or you did some kind of induction or some kind of guided meditation, they would get you to close your eyes. They're trying to get your cognitive conscious thoughts out of the way so they can get to your unconscious mind. So I think when you're listening to an audio book and you're falling asleep, you're getting your conscious mind out of the way and it's going into your unconscious mind. I think if you're cutting the grass and you're listening to an audio book and you're getting your conscious mind out of the way, it's going in your unconscious mind. So I'd argue it's even better than sitting there and actively listening to it. But if you're going, oh, I can't retain it. I've got to go back. Your conscious mind's getting back in the way again. So I've always allowed myself just to listen and not judge And, you know, I'll often do it, listen to it in the gym or going for a walk. Um, And you can always listen to it again. I was just about to say, do you you, you, you listen again Good ones. Yeah, good ones. Good ones or ones that are very technical, I'll listen to them again and and maybe even again. But actually, I think it's a good thing that, I mean, I listen to mine on two times speed uh, and I, I get my subconscious mind out of the way. Do you listen to Russell Brunson on two times speed? No, no, I don't. I don't listen to Russell Brunson. I'm not really that familiar with his stuff, but he speaks fast, I guess. Fucking hell! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I would just say, um, carry on, Matt, uh, and, and and don't judge yourself for the fact that you don't think you're retaining it because you're probably retaining it more in your unconscious mind, where you're building habits. Um, uh, y- y- yeah. Um, uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and apply it today. And as I said earlier, yeah, my my goal with all these podcasts is to get at least one immediately implementable uh, tip or technique. So if if nothing else, that's one for me. But listen, in the last forty minutes of talking to you, I'm sure uh, I'm sure everybody else and myself included has had some fantastic advice on property, inspiration, brand building, and everything in between. So listen, thanks a lot for taking time out to uh, to join me and join my audience. And I hope uh, I hope your your audience have. Uh, I've enjoyed listening to this as well. And uh, it's been great to finally meet you, buddy, even even in a, a virtual sense. My pleasure, Matt. Um, should we shout out your podcast to my audience and mine to yours? Yeah, that'd yeah. be fantastic, guys. So, so, so again, I'm Matt Haycox. I am the Matt Haycox. I am the Matt Haycox on everything. T H E M A T T H A Y C O X. Uh, iTunes, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and, and, and all, all, all the stuff. My 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 story is, you know, I, I I built you know very successful businesses in my early twenties, and then went spectacularly bankrupt by the time I was twenty seven, twenty eight. Start started afresh and effectively uh, moved, you know, became poacher term gamekeeper. Moved to the investment and funding side of the world, and I always say I was a borrower before I'm a lender and I'm a business person before I'm a banker so if you deal with me uh, you will get a completely different sense of, of perspective than dealing with any other funder and then I've effectively built my personal brand off the back of that so it'd be great to meet some of you guys I'm sure we've all got some synergies and Rob uh, please please give yourself another shout out to my guys yeah so my main podcast is called The Disruptive Entrepreneur um, so if you search for Rob Moore um, or The Disruptive Entrepreneur, you'll find me on pretty much every channel. I think, in fact, every channel. Um, so it'd be a pleasure to connect with you and um, hopefully help you build your your business further and become the, the entrepreneur, the startup, the scale up, make the money that you want to make. And as I said at the beginning of this, guys, I, I do genuinely subscribe to Rob's, 